<clears throat> okay, welcome everyone to Physics 203, video number 18. This video is on barriers and tunneling. And these are special type of potential energies <clears throat> that uh, uh, exhibit some very interesting behaviors that uh, have no classical counter counterparts. So we're going to start to see um, more and more um, unusual aspects of quantum behavior in this class. And we'll also get a chance to practice our understanding of uh, how to set up problems using the Schrodinger equation and how to interpret the solutions. So, um, so we start off with reflecting from a small potential barrier. So we start off with barriers. And uh, <clears throat> here's an example where we have a particle moving in from the left with a certain amount of energy. And it, in region one, it has plenty of energy. And then it hits a region of potential, but the potential is less than its total energy. So um, the difference between its energy, total energy and its potential energy would be kinetic energy here, which would be positive, which is allowed. So the particle would pass over this uh, pass over this barrier classically. And then after it went over the barrier, it would continue on with its higher level of kinet kinetic energy from before. So you can think of it kind of like rolling a marble over a hill, um, although this hill is not rounded, it's, it's uh, square. So classically, the particle would slow down since it loses uh, kinetic energy here, but there's no chance of it being reflected um, there would be no question of it, it uh, turning around and coming back the other way. But it turns out quantum mechanically, the particle has a chance of being either uh, reflected or transmitted, even though it has more than enough energy to clear over this barrier. Okay, so how does this work? Well, so it has a chance of being, this is the incident particle and this is uh, the chance for it to be reflected or transmitted. Um, well, we start off with the time-independent Schrodinger equation here, as we did for the infinite square well. And this time, we have to break it into three regions um, because the situation is different or potentially different in all three regions. In region one, um, which x is less than zero, um, v is equal to zero. There's no potential. So we get the, um, setting this equal to zero, we get the same, and solving for the second derivative of psi, we get this equation, which is the same equation we got for the um, uh, infinite square well. However, in this region here, V is not equal to zero, V is equal to V naught. So we have this term V naught, and when we solve this equation, we get, 2m over h bar squared e minus v naught. You can see how the v naught would come over here and become e minus v naught, <clears throat> excuse me, times psi two. And then in region three, again, v goes back to zero, so it's similar in form to region one. So <clears throat> sometimes uh, if the potential changes form in different regions, we have to uh, set up the, uh, Schrodinger equation separately in each region. And then we uh, look at solutions to these equations. Um, I'm writing them here as, uh, or the, the book writes them here as sinusoidal. Um, so we wrote them in, in the last class for the infinite square well as sine x and cosine of kx. You can equivalently write them as e to the i kx and e to the minus i kx because from these two functions, you can build the sine and the cosine. So we have, uh, this is the general solution for um, in region one. Uh, if you plug this in and, and take, the, uh, take the, der the derivative, the second derivative, provided that k1 is equal to square root of two me over h bar, um, you'll find that this equation is satisfied. And the same thing for region three, um, the, if you plug in F, uh, this, this equation to region three, you find that uh, 
as long as k3 is square root of 2 omega over h bar, that this is satisfying. Now in region two, um, it's much the same, except we have a different um, constant here. Instead of e, we have e minus v naught. So k2 turns out to be square root of 2m e minus v naught over h bar, okay? And that makes an important difference. So um, <clears throat> in terms of the waves that we're looking at, this would be the, uh, this would represent the incident wave because it's a traveling wave with positive wave number, meaning it's moving to the right. This would represent the reflected wave because it's in region one and it uh, has a negative wave number, meaning it's moving to the left. And then this right here in region three would represent the transmitted wave because it's moving to the right in region three. So, um, so the idea would be to take these three solutions and uh, plug them in, uh, well, <clears throat> impose the um, boundary conditions that the solutions must match at the boundaries and their derivatives much ma must match at the boundaries and that the wave function has to go to zero at infinity so that it's uh, the whole thing is um, can be normalized. Uh, so that's a good deal of math, and we can uh, <clears throat> certainly can be done. And if you'd like to see it, um, please come see. Please come see me. We can work through it, but we're not going to delve into that level of detail. Um, we're just going to look at the what's called the transmission coefficient, which is the um, the amplitude of the transmitted wave, which would be uh, f star f coefficient of the transmitted wave over a star a coefficient of the incident wave. And that turns out to be, after all this math, um, this expression here. Okay, so um, notice in this expression that. <clears throat> v naught squared is positive. Uh, it's just the height of the potential. E minus V naught is positive. E is positive. So everything's positive. Sine squared is positive. So we have one plus a number which can only be positive or zero, as we'll see in a second, um, one uh, to the minus one. So we have a number greater than one to the minus one power. So we get a transmission coefficient less than one, okay, in general. So in general, this is, usually this is less than one, but it can be equal to one if sine squared is zero. And sine squared is zero where sine is zero, which would be where K, K2L, the argument, would be equal to uh, an integer multiple of pi. So, um, so what does that mean? The reflection probability is one minus T. It's either transmitted or reflected. So if this is a little bit less than one, that means that the reflection probability is one minus something a little bit less than one or greater than one, or great, sorry, greater than zero. So there's a chance that this particle can actually be reflected at the barrier Whereas classically, there's just no way that that can happen, okay? So this is just weird. Um, a particle comes along, it has a ton, plenty of energy to get over this hump, but because of the wave-like behavior of particles, um, there's a chance that it will be uh, bounced back and become a reflected wave, um, a chance for a reflection probability. All right, so let's look at, ton at uh, what we call tunneling through a large potential barrier. This is the opposite situation where the barrier has a potential energy which is greater than the incoming energy. So classically, this would be like trying to roll a, roll a marble up a very large hill and not giving it enough steam. So no matter if you did it a million times, no matter how many times you did it, the marble would never make it up the hill. Um, so it's always gonna be reflected. However, so classically, the particle is definitely, re definitely reflected in hitting region two, the hill or the, the barrier. Quantum mechanically, though, the, it turns out the particle has a chance of being 
reflected, yes, like is classically, but also a chance of being transmitted. Okay, so, and this is called quantum tunneling because it's as if the particle builds a secret tunnel um, un, uh, in, in this mountain. It doesn't go over the mountain, it goes under the mountain and it tunnels through this into a region where it couldn't reach classically. Okay, so um, it turns out that uh, the analysis of uh, this, uh, this problem is similar. Um, it's certainly the same for region one and region three, where we have a particle with energy E. So we have the same uh, uh, trial wave functions there as we did in the previous slide. However, in region two, because E is less than V naught, we actually get a, instead of a, an oscillating solution, oops, a sinusoidal solution. Um, so e to the i kx and e to the minus i kx build sines and cosines, so they're called sinusoidal. We get an exponential solution, um, either a increasing or a decreasing exponential. And um, <clears throat> these are the values, the same values for k1 and k uh, three as before, but now um, kappa the the exponential the the coefficient of the exponential is the square root of two m v naught minus e over h bar, and since v naught the height of the potential is greater than e, kappa is positive. Okay, so that that makes this a uh, since kappa is positive, that makes this uh, sorry since this um, uh, numerator, we're taking the square root of a positive number that makes this a, a real number. So kappa is real um, and we get an exponential solution. So what does this look like? Well, we have sinusoidal waves to the on the left in region one. That's this region one here. And then we get in region two between zero and L, we get this exponential which is a decaying exponential. So it's actually the, uh, this part right here that decays e to the minus kx. Um, it's de decreasing as x. And then we pick up with the sinusoidal over here, okay? So a particle which makes it through comes in as an energetic wave, decays exponentially, um, but then uh, it decays uh, slowly enough that there's a chance some of it can sneak through and come through on the other side with a lesser amplitude and lesser energy. And <clears throat> the um, again, working the calculations here, setting up boundary conditions, um, setting these, these wave functions equal at the boundaries and their derivatives equal at the boundaries, and setting the um, Wave functions to go to zero at infinity, uh, like before. It's a it's a uh, uh, a fairly involved procedure, but we can find the transmission coefficient, which again would be f uh, the f star f over a star a, um, because this is the incident wave and this is the transmitted wave, and it turns out to be very similar to before, except instead of the sine squared. Uh, uh, sine squared, we have uh, sine h squared, and this is called the hyperbolic sine. And just in case you're not familiar with it, the definition of the hyperbolic sine is e to the x minus e to the minus x over two, okay? So it's always a uh, positive number. Um, sine, the hyperbolic sine is always a positive number. Um, and uh, so when we square it, we get a positive number. And so we have one plus, again, a positive number uh, to the minus one. So we get a transmission coefficient, which is less than one. And in fact, um, it's con usually considerably less than one because uh, uh, this kappa times L contains uh, e to the minus kappa times L, which falls off quite quickly with length. Okay, so 
So even for a small length, um, the this decaying exponential makes this makes this term um, makes this term uh, quite large, and makes this term quite large, and so uh, uh, therefore one over that term is quite small. So we get small transmission coefficients, but not zero. Okay, but not zero. So there's a chance that this particle can squeak through and go into this classically disallowed region and tunnel through. And that's one of the remarkable features of uh, um, remarkable phenomena that happens in quantum physics is this quantum tunneling. Um, now, there's a slightly more usable expression here if it turns out mathematically, if you derive if kappa, um, where kappa is this relationship involving the energies times L is much bigger than one, this T is approximately given by uh, this expression here. Okay, that can be shown in a few steps. So here you can explicitly see that the transmission coefficient decreases uh, as the negative exponential of kappa times L. And <clears throat> kappa involves the difference in energies between the um, between the um, height of the potential and the height and the energy and the incoming energy. So the 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 greater the gap between the incoming energy and the potential has to over oops sorry has to overcome uh, the greater kappa is and the greater the length is the greater distance the particle has to tunnel. So you can see that this tunneling coefficient is um, e to the minus kappa times L. So it's an exponential decay and it increases with the length L and also with these, this energy difference, V naught minus E. Um, so uh, what are some examples of quantum tunneling? Some applications? Well, there's a couple of very interesting ones. Um, there's some in semiconductors and called called tunnel diodes. We won't talk about those here, but um, we'll talk about alpha decay. Um, so in alpha decay, as some of you may know, this is a form of radioactivity in which a uh, large atom releases a helium nucleus. And um, this is a, <clears throat> a diagram of the potential energy for a helium nucleus. This is the distance of the nucleus, uh, sorry, the distance of the alpha particle from the, um, the rest of the nucleus. And this is the electrical repulsion, which occurs because the alpha particle has positive charge and the nucleus has positive charge. So this is called the Coulomb potential energy barrier. And then once the particle gets close enough, there's a, another force called the strong nuclear force which is the glue that holds nuclei together, and that forms a strong potential well, which, which would bind the alpha particle. But uh, if an alpha particle approaches the nucleus, it would classically, it wouldn't make it in, because it's just got this, it's got this energy here, so it would just come in and then bounce back off. Um, but quantum mechanically, there's a chance for it to tunnel through, just like the tunneling we saw before. And likewise, if an alpha particle is uh, tr within the nucleus, um, if, an if a helium uh, nucleus is uh, a, a two, two protons, that is, basically, are in the nucleus, there's a chance that they will tunnel out and make it out of the nucleus. And that is the mechanism of alpha decay. If, if this quantum tunneling didn't occur, radioactive decay, in the form of alpha decay would take much, 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 much longer, and uh, <clears throat> we wouldn't. We would have very radioactive substances lasting for billions of years. Okay, so very important application. Um, so the tunneling release allows for the re the release of the alpha particle past this large energy barrier, this um, electrostat electrical energy barrier. Um, hydrogen fusion in a star is another really interesting one. Um, so 
inside a star, in the core of the star, we have mostly protons because matter is broken down, uh, hydrogen atoms are broken down into a plasma, which is uh, protons and electrons, which have been just torn apart by the high, high uh, ener uh, temperatures, 15, 15 million Kelvin. But even at that temperature of 15 million Kelvin, those, those protons are zipping around, but they are, their repulsion is such that when they come together, they lack the kinetic energy to overcome the electrical repulsion become them, so between them. So classically, they would come up and try to climb up this hill and then come back, come back uh, down the hill. Um, and so we wouldn't get fusion of protons into uh, helium and helium into uh, uh, deute deuterium and tritium and uh, the other elements that are made in stars. So what happens? Well, it's quantum tunneling. We have, it's not, it, we know it's not a classical proton. Uh, it's a, uh, a proton which is represented as a wave. So we have this barrier between the two protons and we have this wave which comes in and then it decays exponentially uh, through this barrier, and then there's a ch and there's a chance that it can make it through, and the two protons can then form a what's called a bound state, um, that they get together and form a bound state of a uh, <clears throat> helium nucleus, and then there's a whole series of other reactions which occurs. I don't mean to suggest there's only one reaction for fusion, but this is the main one. So. Um, this quantum tunneling is quite rare. It enables this reaction between two protons to take place in one out of 10 to the 28th collisions. Okay, so one out of 10 followed by, uh, one followed by 28 zeros, this will actually occur. So that doesn't seem too promising until you consider that the sun has so many, is so big and, and, and has so many protons in its core that there are about 10 to the 66 collisions between protons per second. So 10 to the 66 collisions per second with a chance of one out of 10 to the 28 gives uh, 66 minus 28 would be uh, 38. I think that's right, 38. Uh, 10 to the 38 proton, proton, successful proton, proton collisions per second. And this, so this is often enough um, to produce the light energy emitted by the sun. So without quantum tunneling, we wouldn't have nuclear fusion and hydrogen fusion um, within the sun. So I hope you've appreciated um, <clears throat> some of these interesting quantum phenomena that can occur. Um, reflection from a, uh, of a particle <clears throat> with greater energy than a barrier when it would uh, be automatically transmitted classically, and then tunneling of a particle which would automatically be um, reflected. And uh, these applications in um, alpha decay radioactivity and hydrogen fusion. So quantum mechanics is a, is a key part of, of many, uh, many of the phenomena that, that make our universe the way it is. Thank you for your attention and uh, I'll see you in class.